Okay, I think we'd like to make a start and we have, we're going to begin with just a quick announcement about the book that this seminar is going to be launching. So over to you, Rani. Do you want to come to the mic? Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Rani from SOAS Sri Lanka Society. We run the bookstore um, here on a regular basis. If you want the book today and you're very keen, there is a leaflet going around which you can take and you get a discount. If you wanted to get the paperback version, please sign up because we will have that in a few months' time. Thank you. And you'll get a signed copy by both authors, whichever one you get. Thank you. Okay, well, I'd add my welcome to that of uh, Rani's to this seminar. I'm Sean Hawthorne. I work in the department of, I think it's school actually, of history, religions and philosophies. And the reason why I'm going to be chairing this event this evening is that I am one of the co-editors of the book series in which this book appears, which is the Bloomsbury series of, I need to check, oh no, um, <laughs> uh, religion, gender and sexuality. And I have one of my co-editors here today. Sonia, where have you gone? There you are, well, right at the front, yeah. Um, uh, from Kingston University. But one of our other editors is John Llewellyn at the University of um, Chester. Now, the whole series was set up with the explicit attention, intention of addressing the neglect of religious studies perspectives um, and, in fact, often hostility to religious identities and discourses in gender, queer, and sexuality studies. Um, but more importantly than that, we've wanted to open up a space in which gender-critical approaches to religions um, can be, and in fact must be, much more engaged with questions, for want of a better word, intersectional, intersectionality, particularly with respect to those bodies of theories that we might name coming from uh, subjugated knowledge, but particularly critical race, disability, post- and decolonial theory. These have hitherto been really rather marginal in the fields of religion and gender. And it was with this in mind that Tej and Verinder's work seem to be really ideally placed as the first book in this series, given that they, um, as I hope you'll see tonight, really exemplify the kind of work that we hope to publish. And we're really proud that their book is the first in the series because it really sets the tone and the ethos of what we want to achieve. Now, some of the background context to what we're doing here tonight is to think through how scholars have thought about religion. And I know perhaps in development studies that religion seems one of those things that you shouldn't really have to um, concern yourselves with. But we're particularly interested in the relationship that it has to what gets named as the political and how so many approaches to the relationship between these two things have focused on maintaining the clarity of their difference. Um, that is the difference between the political and the religious, because their difference is largely constitutive, in fact, is, is foundational to any kind of understanding of modernity. It's also foundational to Eurocentric understandings of social and political organization that, of course, informed the organization of space, of populations in the colonial era, not least in the ways in which partition uh, occurred or was arrived at in 1947. Religion seemed to be an important factor in the way in which space was divided. Now, when one begins to address uh, the question of the relationship of the religious to the political, um, other significant me mechanisms of what I say are mechanisms of division um, that are also um, themselves a significant part of how modernity um, narrates itself, were inherited from colonial conceptuality as well. For example, around caste, gender, and intra-religious difference. Now, the choices within the scholarship that's tried to understand the relationship between these things has tended to repeat the starkness of the separability between their objects of analysis. And in other words, they end up repeating a Eurocentric framework that, as we'll see tonight, is almost entirely inadequate for making sense of the creativity of, at the very least, subaltern sociality and meaning making. What the fields of religion and gender, religious studies, political science, and yes, development studies have needed in order to reach for what Morney Joy has called intellectual adequacy in a post-colonial world is an approach that is resistant to methodological nationalism and in fact seizes on the creative and what I would argue is also the ethical potential of border crossing, indeed border defying. 
to account for the lived realities of populations living in the aftermath of schismatic events like partition, their material culture, its embeddedness in unpredictable forms of mobility, affect, culture, uh, uh, cultures of memory, and so on. And this is what we really have with Tej and Verinder's wonderful work. When I first read a very early draft of the manuscript, I was absolutely captivated. I think most of my commentary as I worked through it were really exclamations of, yes, exactly. Um, this is what we need. This is brilliant. This was exactly what I had been looking for. I hadn't quite known how to go about doing the kind of analysis and bridging work and kind of exquisitely attuned, uh, uh, exquisite sensitive attunement to the complicated ways in which people grapple with these terms um, and, the, and arrangements that the colonial period left us as its remainder, but which has to be done if we're going to go on using words like religion and gender and caste at all, not fall into the tired old Eurocentric imperialist taxonomies that commit us to repeating their logic. This book is a manual for doing much better scholarship. It's not doctrinaire, it's provocative, and it's stimulating in the true sense of those terms. Tej and Verinder don't just stop with giving us a satisfyingly complicated and faithful account, and again, in the, all the senses of that term, of subaltern engagements with hegemonic structures. They give us a way in which to avoid reductive and thus entirely distortive renderings with the vexed questions around resistance and agency and of caste, gender in relationship to those things that get named as religion but also get us to think beyond these framings. This work is about subaltern registers of resistance but it's also about so much more than this. In fact, it performs what it sets out to understand. It makes full use of the metaphors and practices of border crossing to provoke new ways of knowing and understanding. And it really is an exemplar of the best that social, socially engaged scholarship has to offer. And what we're going to do tonight is hear from both Tej and Verinder about the process of arriving at the forms of theorization um, that they did in this particular uh, book over really quite a long period of time, over 10 um, years. So we're going to start with Tej, followed by Verinder. We're going to have a very brief musical interlude by Sarah Kazmi, followed by a response from Akanksha Mehta, who's a lecturer in Gender, Race and Cultural Studies at Goldsmiths, and then we'll have a period of question and answer. Um, and then you're all very, very welcome to join us for a reception in the senior common room, which is on the first floor. And basically, you just follow the people if you don't know how to um, get there. So I'm not going to take up any more time. I'd just like you to welcome both Paige and Verinda and also Akanksha and Sara uh, for what's going to be a really wonderful and provoking evening. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for your very generous comments and for your um, inputs into the book project um, in its, well, through the course of it developing into a book. Um, it has taken 10 years from the point of the inception of the project, but actually it's probably taken about maybe 27 or eight years in terms of the actual ethnographic kind of field work which I'll be talking about um, um, as, I, as I go here. Um, I have a number of people I'd like to thank, but I'm probably going to do that at the end rather than as I begin um, to, to just give you a sense of, of what the book is about. Um, so the title that we've given for, the, for this talk actually was a ploy to get you in here. Um, <laughs> it's not really about religious nationalism at all. Um, but the concern, and rightly so, on religious nationalism, its rise, its ascent, its penetration of majoritarian right-wing religious nationalism and the ways in which the state in India, as well as Pakistan, utilizes religion as the colonial state once did in order to further its authority over politics and the economy, makes inroads into and shapes the social and cultural space. The problem of religion, therefore, is not about whether or not its influence is on the rise or decline. That's neither here nor there, and those debates have been had within religious studies, and neither of us are scholars of, of religious studies either. We're both social scientists, political science, development studies, sociology. So therefore, why are we engaging in this field? Um, you know, a lot of the kind of Eurocentric notions about um, religion, a lot of the debates around secularization, questioning enlightenment principles, which appear in discourse, 
to instill ideas about rationality, which are also very much present within contemporary social science engagements and political discourse on religion. And particularly in contemporary South Asia, with the not just ascent penetration now of um, right-wing forces, we see that religion is not just something that is out there. It's very much part of the, the body politic and sociality. So the successes of populism in India and Pakistan show their ongoing similarities. 70 two years after the partition of the partition. So in some ways this book is about the long partition, the ongoing partition. Um, we're looking at bordering processes. Um, and the looming blasphemy laws, for instance, in Pakistan, which see the rise of the social in terms of community arbitration, vigilantism and mob rule in policing and disciplining minorities, namely Christians and Amdis, for instance, in Pakistan. And of course, in India, um, we have just on November 9th was a very momentous day in the region. Um, which was just 10 days ago, we saw how on the very same day that the Indian Supreme Court ruling on Ayodhya, which sanctioned the building of a Ram temple on the site of the Babri Masjid, which had been desecrated um, in 1992, um, on the very same day, the Pakistan government, um, and of course in communication with the Indian government, opened the Kartarpur Corridor with a somewhat co coordinated two-nation agreement on the lines of partition. This is based on a sharpened logic around minorities and majorities for whom shrines, and interestingly, and, and this is kind of writing this into this presentation now, it's a kind of politics around shrines um, in the performance of nationalism and carving out communities, you know, through on the one hand communities whose sites can be seen to be desecrated, or on the other hand, another community which can seem to be res resurrected um, in Kartarpur um, in the kind of post aftermath of the post post partition era that is, is emerging. Both prime ministers who in February 2019, two countries who were on the brink of war and have been over the past 72 years, were both present at that commemoration of the opening of the Kartarpur corridor. So in a play of showing appeasement to one minority while sanctioning the desecration and announcing the building of the mandir on the site of another, the Indian government has shown that utilizing religious boundaries continues to gain political mileage for violence, identity politics, utilizing religious national difference. But our focus in the book is about another register, that of resistance in the face of hegemony in all of its forms, social, political, economic, which is often not always encased sorry, which is often but not always encased in the rituals and spaces of religion. It is this resistance from below which continues to evolve in synchronicity with hegemonic power and which falls beyond and beneath the realm of populism. Just as power and hegemony erect, construct and manage the logics of borders and nationalism, caste and gender uh, are highlighted in terms of the resistance of it. Human agency is key to this interpretive framework, drawing on, but not confined to, a Gramscian tradition where hegemony is present and looming, but never all-encompassing or all-pervasive. As a consequence, our primary attention to the contemporary social field offers methodological and conceptual possibilities to analyze what people do in terms of looking at uh, Michel de Certeau's work, what people do rather than what they say they do. Thus, the point at which formal religion making, in terms of identity construction, those identities, religious boundaries, which were all part of the colonial project, are also part of a nexus of religion breaking, which is one of the contributions, I think, of, of, of the book. Shrines enable us to locate persistence of practices in, in multiple sites upon and through which multiple discourses crisscross and whilst the lens of communalism pervades in historical textual constructions, the significance for contemporary devotees is much more closely associated with the, the, the idea of the possibility of impeding or even transforming the, the social and the material. So that's a critical view of how structures and hierarchies of gender and caste operate in terms of social organization, characterizes uh, Punjab in a way which is about social stratification and some of the literature and religion in Punjab, and there is a lot of it. We'll talk about the enchanted universe to, in terms of uh, Herjo Dobroy's contribution. And we actually argue that it's a stratified universe and we're looking very much rooting it within the social, the material and the political. 
Um, I'm going to, in our conclusion, we begin with a, with a story of a friend who appears throughout the ethnographic kind of analysis and is also in our acknowledgements. Um, and I think I need to say this sort of in terms of my own discipline of development studies, um, is around the kind of um, reluctance to talk about religion. So this friend who was very active in leftist circles in Pakistan during the period of General Zia tells a joke in Punjabi um, that talks of and very much frames his own atheism. And the, and the joke goes, when Karl Marx dies, the angel Gabriel is puzzled as to whether he should be sent to heaven or hell. So he asks God what to do. God says, let him come and talk to me. So Marx is led into an audience with God who is sat up on his throne. Gabriel leaves the two talking. A few hours pass and Gabriel is worried. So he opens a crack in the door to God's chamber to observe a strange scene in which God and Marx are sitting on the floor opposite each other and chatting. Suddenly God says, don't just stand there comrade Gabriel, come and join us. <laughs> so while so while this kind of idea of, and, and the kind of reluctance to talk about religion is happening, I think in some ways that joke you know, is, is, is narrated at many kind of parties and gatherings, and of course very much about the kind of reluctance of the left as well, and of social sciences more broadly, of engaging with, with religion, we also have seen the rise, the ascent, and penetration of majoritarianism, and we might also label it as fascism in South Asia. And so in some ways that, that's, that's a warning signal that in fact we've been missing out on those kinds of conversations, which that joke in many ways achieves. Um, so our studies utilize a kind of Gramscian methodological criteria rather explicitly um, in terms of his schema for the study of uh, subalternity, culture, and resistance. Um, and, and this is in terms of his discussion of popular cultures, class struggle, and dominant class ideology, in terms of how he shaped his notion of the war position in which popular culture or popular religion were a part of life and the world. And as such, um, that life and the world, and that popular culture engaging with it, can possibly be a source of conflict and, a size, and also a site of struggle. So we're kind of positing a feminist Gramscian Marxism and trying to you know, position the, the theoretical thrust of the book as, having a con as being very conscious of gender, caste, and class oppression in terms of providing immense possibilities to break the aforementioned closures and bringing hegemony, resistance, and agency into focus. So the hierarchical, and this is kind of bringing us to Punjab, so I'm giving you the border here. So this is, there are a number of contributions of the book um, that it makes, but I'll probably focus on two in particular. One is methodological nationalism, challenging it, and using the idea of bordering processes and bordering logics uh, as an analytical lens through which to understand the social. So our study is looking at Punjab across what is either seen as Indian or Pakistani Punjab, depending on what your position on it is, East, West Punjab. Um, but we, in many ways, have the, the project was designed as a way of thinking of almost an imaginary of a place that only 72 years ago was geographically, at least, one. Of course, bordering processes are not all just about geography or cartography. Bordering processes are also about the social. And so there's a lot about the coloniality of the religious categories in terms of the, the ways in which the colonial state um, utilized knowledge about societies as a way of controlling for political control. And so a lot of the resistances then we see and we have seen in the kind of fieldwork we were doing in the shrines, which are across Punjab, so you can kind of see that line that cuts through the, the Radcliffe line. Um, our field work doesn't do it seamlessly, of course, there's border crossing that is required to do this, and the border crossing is also not just physical, it is also one where it requires an imaginary to think outside of the categories of religion. Oftentimes, and, and of course, religious nationalism itself is inclined towards Pakistan as being the, the homeland of Muslims in South Asia, and India now, of course, as being a majoritarian Hindu nation, or at one point seeing it as a secular nation. So I'll, I'll use this map now as the backdrop, as one which is kind of looking at you know, Punjab as being the land of five rivers. But there's a lot of mythology and um, nostalgia about this, which needs to also be problematized. So a lot of the literature on the region of Punjab poses the idea of Punjabiyat 
um, of identity, of being Punjabi through language, culture, history, um, religion even, as a shared sense of identity, um, can also produce, and what we've highlighted in terms of the gender caste uh, matrix that we apply in the, is that it, it ignores the fact that this is a highly unequal society. Um, we see a, a lack of recognition the fact of, of caste even existing in, in Punjab, in Pakistan. And in East Punjab, you can see in terms of the ways in the codification of the census as a tool of enumeration of society, that it has, you know, 30, 31% um, of scheduled caste populations, which, you know, is, of course, official statistic, but shows that this is a society which is in many ways structured through caste. So one of the contributions of the book is to look at actually reading through the social how religion and what people do rather than what they say they do, rather than saying, I am, this is my identity and this is the place that I go to practice these rituals. This is what I do. And understanding those practices as perhaps, and not always, informing a, a subaltern um, notion of, 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 of existence within existing mater, uh, material relations. I don't think how much time I have. I, how, how much time do I have? I've lost. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, I'll, I'll carry on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it's okay, fine, that's fine. Okay, sure, I'll just take it. Okay, um, so, yeah, so, um, okay, okay. So, so bordering logics and overcoming methodological nationalism, so that's one contribution I've highlighted. The most obvious is this idea of even thinking across the Radcliffe line, you know, which is a remnant of the colonial period, but is also something that, that still um, very much is a presence there. Um, the patrolling of the boundaries of religion are also part of the bordering logics in terms of correct religious practice, in terms of the imposition of religious authority, high caste male patriarchal religious leadership on the one hand and the kinds of practices and things we've published elsewhere on women's practices, Dalit practices which are relegated to the margins and are included in this idea of formal uh, religion or even of society that is even worth counting. So if our lens is focused in that direction, we also see that there, um, there's the, the idea of borders in motion, to, to use Victor Conrad's concept, that borders in motion we saw in terms of the field as being an organizing principle of how, how society was just getting on. Um, our project not only set out to explore practices, sites, and figures across that line and across Punjab, um, but it also endeavored to examine how other exclusionary logics, such as religious ca categorization, state intervention, naming, labeling practices, um, operated across the various sites and contexts. We set out to resist the straitjacket of methodological nationalism from the onset by not, not taking on labels or categories at face value, which was only made possible because of our access to both sides of the border. And there's a whole thing we write about, both of us do not have, neither of us have Indian or Pakistani uh, passports. And that of course offers one entry in terms of access in transcending the border. Although the Kartarpur corridor is only open for, to Indian uh, passport holders. So that's some place that we will not be able to access unless you have an OCI card. Okay, um, on the other hand, um, It's also about the idea of even being able to imagine or construct a field. And I think perhaps one of the biggest, um, yeah, one of the biggest contributions of the book, and I think this is probably why it took so long to actually write, was coming to, coming to grips with the kind of social realities, the things we were observing in the field, you know, the, the kinds of rituals and things that we, we couldn't even understand what was happening until you spent the time doing that kind of long-term um, ongoing ethnographic work. Um, but it, in, in many ways, one of the challenges is also trying to open up borders and to think critically about the borders, not only as sites of difference, but also as sites where change, challenge, and resistance are also taking place. So another point is also the making and breaking of religion. And I think this is where the potentials um, in terms of the, the 
the arguments against looking at and the idea of kind of false consciousness also uh, emerges quite a bit in terms of the religion literature, in terms of social science engagement is, you know, what, what, what kind of, um, you know, um, what kinds of practices are, are going on and what are the meanings? They're thinking about agency and I'm high, kind of highlighting women's practices, Dalit's practices. What, what, do they, what do they highlight, not in terms of the labels that are given, but in terms of the social realities and grievances about um, the means of production, about ownership, um, about proprietary rights that those sites can tell us? Especially in the context when um, mainstream po politics have been captured by majoritarian politics. There's been a silencing through populism of those other zones in which people are actually engaging with. So for instance, a shrine which comes up um, on the road between Jandigarh and Patiala, where it started off as a water tap, it begins as a water tap and a story emerges around it and it becomes sacralized. Um, as a site where truck drivers will stop and slowly over time you see a shrine emerges and slowly over time you see a slightly more elaborate shrine emerge. So these kinds of examples were things that we were coming across during our field work during this extended period of time. So you begin to read then what people are doing and what you, if you look at face value or reading the signs and symbols on that particular shrine, you would see, and this um, was one of the entry points into us uh, starting this project, were in um, East Punjab, in India, there was a, a very noticeable um, presence of green flags and green chadars, which looked as though there was an, you know, in migration of Muslims from other parts of, of India. But in fact, as our field work began to inform us that this was part of the social that was happening all around us within the population itself. And so that shows that the life of a shrine in itself, or the life of society is responding to the broader political context, but is also engaging with the material. Um, there's one other um, point that we engage with, which is the myth of the egalitarian, or the meta-narrative of egalitarianism that exists in Punjab. So if anyone's ever traveled to Punjab, um, you will probably hear lots of sayings about this and the, 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 uh, you know, it's a place of harvest, abundance, and on the other hand, you know, th this idea that actually there's no caste here, it's a casteless society, it's not Brahminical, um, in fact, Brahmins are impoverished, so this is the, kind of, the kinds of rhetoric that you would hear. On the other hand, the egalitarian meta-narrative also provides a myth, and so we ended up reading that myth in many ways textually, um, in terms of what people said they were doing and what they were doing, um, in terms of practices. Um, but also that the, the idea of the, the resistance to change. So many arguments within formal institutionalized religion would be that, oh, change doesn't happen because um, you know, Dalits, women, other subaltern groups, they're not religious enough. Okay? So this is one, and this is one conversation that exists within that particular zone. Uh, another one is that, in fact, these are groups that are splintering off from within this era, er, area of resistance may not be seeing it as resistance at all in their own terms. And I think there's a lot of complexities around thinking about what, actual, what agency, hegemony and resistance mean when we're looking at the, this, this uh, kind of sphere of, of religious practice. So I hope I've not confused you too much about the kind of theoretical points that the book makes, but I think Rinder's going to be highlighting some of the empirical examples. Um, so while, uh, while I get my laptop set up, you can, I, some of you have met this chat before, because uh, some of you have heard me talk about this before, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to... Um, prepare something too different for, I know at least two of you have heard some of this before, so for you two at least, I'm sorry I haven't, but maybe many of you haven't. So um, in a sense, uh, I, I, I wanna, I'm going to talk about two examples from uh, the work that we did, um, but I don't, want to, I don't want us to think about these two examples in terms of ethnographic vignettes. Uh, uh, rather, I think uh, I want to think about them as things that we just ignore or that we don't look at when we have a view of religion or the social uh, in which, well, religion can only be a single thing. Because if you look at this image, 
there is a, a multiplicity of religious symbols going on, right? This, this guy, his name is, well, actually, you've got, you've got his full name there, but if we just had his name Papu up there, P-A-P-P-U, you couldn't tell what his religious affiliation was, yeah? Uh, he, when I was younger, I might have had a black beard like that, and, uh, but his turban looks a bit like mine. There's a cross there, there's green, and so there's a, uh, and there's a shrine with a turban on top of it, which is, so there are multipli there's a multiplicity, if you like. Uh, there's also, um, I don't, you can't see it on the covering, there's a seven, 786, and there's Arabic writing on it. Um, so, how would we describe this if we were restricted to uh, a language of religious identification, which meant that you only have, you only come from one religious background or one religious tradition, pretty hard to describe. I mean, it's pretty easy to describe in one, in one sense, because you could say, oh, look, there are Christian symbols and there are Islamic symbols and there are these symbols going on, and this is a confused person. Uh, a confused person is not what we generally think of as the revolutionary subject. Um, a confused person is someone we want to educate. Uh, in the 19th century, it's someone we wanted to reform. Uh, yet, this picture was taken in 2009, 2010, 2009? Yeah, 10, maybe this one. Uh, so, it, you know, obviously had survived, this person has obviously, and his family survived 100 years of colonial reform uh, gone on. And, and like, we, we kind of say that um, if, I, there's a nice bit in the book where we talk about religion as the opium of the masses for, Mar, uh, for Marx, but it's the opiate for the states of Pakistan and India who have, who have gone kind of like quite wild on the ways in which they, they use religion. Um, so what does Papu tell us about this shrine? So he says that basically, uh, and this is the center of that village or the old village, he says, my Baba, uh, my grandfather was here and my father and now I'm here. Some people ask me who was in the tomb um, and make a fuss. Some say he was a Christian, some say he was a, a Muslim. Uh, his name was Baba Gurbaksh and his father was Baba Mehdas. My family is also buried here, so around the shrine there are many, uh, there are many other gravestones. Um, and we've been doing service, we've been looking after this shrine since the time of my grandfather. His name was Pratap Singh. So now the rest of my family, they go to church, but we mostly stay here. We go to the church sometimes. Um, you know, our elders, they used to eat maldangar, carrion. So he's expressing himself as a Dalit. So this is, but this is the only way he expresses his identity as a Dalit, which is through what they used to do. There's no other assertion of identity in this narrative. And then he took me to the side and says, actually, there are four kirpans, which are the Sikh uh, sword, buried over here, because, you know, that's what we really are, wink, wink. And that's how he, and that's how he was uh, talking to me. So a shrine with this kind of level of multiplicity is relatively rare in present-day West Punjab. As some of the prominent sites of these kinds of figures through the 19th century, the Nats, the Gopal Dasis, uh, the Beragis, have kind of left, have fought, fallen into ruin. Um, but the persistence of caste inequality and discrimination is referenced here um, because uh, Papu talked about, uh, well, talked about to me about the ways in which people would come and say to him and to his family, look, just tell us, just become a Christian or just become a Muslim. Like, what is this? Why are you looking after this site? So, and, and the feeling of suspicion was quite prominent in, in the interview that we did. Um, and, and this kind of air of threat, I think, is very important. So that's the kind of first point about sites like this, that there is a... Uh, there's always a kind of underlying sense of tension or violence where in, in, in the era of minoritization of religious, of religious groups generally. The second point, uh, and, and this is really just for you, Sarah and Chris, the second point is really about um, uh, how do we, why is it that we, you know, why is it that we don't see these sites in outside of the kind of ethnographic res residue, right? So, oh, look, this is, this is fun, right? Look, someone who's, not, who's playing with their religious categories, what do we call it now? Like fluid identities. We've discovered this in the kind of 
post something turn. I'm too old now. I would say when I was studying at SOAS, it was postmodern. I could say that with some conviction, but now we have done, done with our posts. Um, so in a way, uh, it's partly, I think, because the academic, the canon of academia has been so invested in methodological nationalism. Religion itself is, uh, as, a, as a subject area has been so invested in certain kinds of classificatory regimes and then the undoing of those classificatory regimes that if we move to think about other sites, like if we think about gender or we think about caste, then we get a different angle. Or if we think about just the local in a different way. And this is why uh, I've got the name of uh, the friend, colleague, local historian who took us to this shrine, a, a guy called Iqbal Kessa, who again, some of you might know in this room. And Iqbal Kessa is not a academic. He's actually a social, hist he's, a, he's an amateur social historian, we would call him in the kind of British uh, sense. Um, yet he knows about 25, 30 sites like this across Lahore, Greater Lahore. He, he knows about gravestones that have got multiple markings on them. He has a whole catalog of, and that's because his understanding of that area, which he's really interested in, is deeply rooted in a locality and a materiality. And that location in materiality and locality doesn't come from us going in as kind of academics or ethnographers. We learned our way of seeing through these, with, through these folks. We didn't, we, we, the, the reason why the book took so long is because you have to sift through a lot of academic uh, ways of seeing which don't really help you. So in a sense, we had to theorize what uh, was a local practice, which is about thinking about your material relations, about thinking about gender relations. Um, and because I'm just conscious of time, I'm not going to go into this little bit about Scott. I am just going to cross, cross the border and talk about another, another, uh, another site. Um, and this is um, someone called Jenny. Uh, and though you haven't put her surname, she, her name, she's called Jenny Shah. Uh, which, uh, again, the Shah would give away something about her, but would be very nicely misleading if you, if you knew what it meant. Jenny itself, you can't tell religious affiliation. Uh, why we love this picture, of course, is that very unusual to see a woman uh, in East Punjab with a hookah in her hand. Maybe now in West Punjab also you see less women, though my, in villages, I, you know, you see a lot of women with hookahs in their hand in West Punjab. But again, we don't see this imagery so much of a woman with a hookah. Hookah is a, you should all know this, now shisha, isn't it, in the contemporary, contemporary student speak. So she's, she's smoking a shisha. And she's wearing this pink turban. Janni herself uh, is a, why she's called Janni Shah is because she's a shrine caretaker uh, in Jalandhar in Hoshiarpur. How did she become a shrine caretaker? Uh, well, a very standard story. She spent 20 years cleaning the floor of the shrine, uh, where the, and the guy who was the, the sant in the East Punjab context, the spiritual figure, he passed on the, the, the shrine, or the gaddi, or the seat of the shrine, to Jenny, to this woman. Uh, and, the, and then around that, there are lovely stories that she would sweep the, the shrine with her hair, which is the, to the level of her devotion. And uh, apocryphal, apocryphal stories, of course. Because her, who is she herself outside of that context? A daily wage laborer, someone who was thrown out of their family house, came to the shrine as a refuge. Uh, someone who, again, from a Dalit background, for whom the shrine itself you could see as a refuge. Very few stories of women. Uh, we, we found very few stories of women. But again, is that our eye? Uh, this Jenny herself, actually, uh, I don't know how many of you saw Ajay Bhardwaj's film. It was shown here a few times. But Jenny herself is, one, is a feature of, his, of uh, Ajay Bhardwaj's film. Ajay is not an academic though he may be trying to get his PhD now. But uh, he's not a formerly an academic. He's trained as a documentary filmmaker. He went back to his village after his grandmother died to start filming his village. And as he started to film, he started finding all sorts of characters and all sorts of people. 
he was not looking at religion, he wasn't looking at shrines, he was again just looking at his locality, but with a certain eye, it was with a certain sensitivity. Why don't we have uh, this sensitivity? There are a number of reasons for that, but our argument is basically it's because of the way in which we think about uh, religion. That because we think about religion as a category sometime, somewhat outside of the social stratifications of this area, we, uh, we, lose, we lose a certain kind of perspective. And when we lose that perspective, and I gave this talk, um, I gave a much longer version of this talk in Melbourne, actually, and uh, a, quite a few uh, ex-academics from uh, universities around East Punjab came. There was about eight of these guys. And one of them piped up, who was a management science professor, so maybe that's what you expect from management science. Um, one of them piped up and said, this isn't anything to do with religion. This is just people's culture. And I was like, thank you. Thank you very much. Because, of course, what else is that? Um, and the, the, so our perspective on religion is, yes, it's part of people's culture. It's part of people's everyday life, but you have to be able to turn your lens to relate it. You can't, again, Jani is not someone that we can easily classify or ca characterize uh, in relationship to, uh, to the, the question of um, singular religious identity. So in, in, in terms of our commitment to analyzing uh, gender and caste um, at sites and institutional processes. What we found was uh, that, yeah, the exclusion, that there was an operation of exclusion. So when you go to uh, larger shrines even, they work on the basis of certain forms of exclusion. So women are excluded from the inner, inner sanctums, uh, places like Data Saab in Lahore. Uh, women are not, uh, the, the, the law may have changed last week, but or the, the local ruling may have changed. Women are not allowed to, are not allowed to perform rituals in the central Sikh shrine at the, in Amritsar, at the Golden Temple, uh, the Harmanda Sab. So these exclusions of women, and Dalits have historically been excluded from many uh, Gurdwaras, uh, even, even, even today. I mean, you, you will find that there is Dalit exclusion. So this, this kind of notion of exclusion makes you think about, well, is this just a response? Is this just a, it, how, how, is this just a reactionary, are these just reactor, reactionary forces where Dalits or women, shrines are these spaces of solace? They're not spaces in which we have uh, kinds of assertion, yeah? And there are many, there are many other sites that I, we've not talked about uh, where where you see some forms of assertion, you do see violent kind of, violent kind of reprisal. So one of the themes in the book is about this issue, of this kind of notion of violent reprisal. Um, but, another, I mean, but another issue for us in, in that sense was we, we were not just interested in this idea of reaction or reactive, or, or like people being reactive to uh, dominance. Um, and there we're kind, and there in a sense we are kind of lucky, uh, or lucky, or there is something about this region. And, and we didn't take Punjab either geographically or f physically. We took it as a kind of idea of in relationship to thinking about practices and thinking about texts. And in that sense, there is a kind of poetic, poetic philosophical tradition, which is what I quite, kind of call it, um, which is enabling in some senses of some of these practices, or at least you can tie in some of these practices with a, this alternative uh, narration of now the word becomes difficult. I would, of course, say culture, but if you don't want to use culture because it's so slippery, you could say an alternative narration of spirituality or an alternative nation, uh, narration of uh, the relationship between humans and uh, the immaterial, material, immaterial. Um, so we, like in the book, it's punctuated basically with uh, poetry and it's punctuated with song because that's the one area in which we found someone like, so Jenny could be represented actually. Uh, and she may not be singing these songs herself. I mean, she would probably be singing quite a lot of, well, she was singing a lot of devotional songs in this film actually. But um, this philosophical tradition allows us in some senses to think outside of the uh, just practice, 
Yeah, it allows us to connect practices with a certain kind of, I don't want to use this word ideology, but why not? With a certain kind of ideological stream. And so um, what, I want, what I want to do is I want to ask Sarah to come and uh, sing to you from this tradition. And this is a kind of, uh, I'm going to let you do it. You want to introduce the text? Because you might be able to do it much sure. better than me impromptu. Sure, I can do that. I'm going to drink your water as well. So um, this is a text by uh, one of the kind of dissident Sufi poets, um, Bule Shah, and he's also a big mainstream spiritual figure. So his shrine in Kasur um, is a major uh, site, and it's a state-controlled, state-run site. Um, but the kind of interesting, um, I guess, difference is also between uh, Bulisha's appropriation by the state and, and what that Bulisha looks like. So at his shrine, you will definitely see lots of Quranic inscriptions and verses, but uh, not this, not his poetry as much, and especially not this poem, which actually was in a sense kind of lost to us, which means that it is not even a major part of the repertoire of um, the, most of the Kawals. So of course, Bulisha's poetry has a big presence in Kawali. So this uh, particular kafi, uh, which is the form, and Bulisha is 18th century, is, and he's a shah, and he's a, not the Chani shah kind of shah, sure. but, right. or maybe he was, you know. We don't know, we don't know in, enough about him at all. Yeah. But um, um, as a, a, a poet and sort of um, religious or spiritual intellectual of the Sayyid, caste or, or um, group, which is uh, the kind of ha like said to be directly descended from the prophet. This is here he's saying, I am a churi, which is um, essentially a Dalit subcaste. And, and so, and this kind of why it's interesting is that it, it is not just, um, it's not the male, it's also female. So there's a double kind of identification that with the Dalit caste and with uh, the woman that Bulisha is, is kind of undertaking. And he's talking specifically about uh, labor and, the, and Dalit labor and its exploitation under the, the Mughal regime and the Mughal kind of agrarian system of revenue. Um, and um, so I think I should just sing it because the translation is is up there. Oh, you have both. Oh, that's great. But then wrong text, probably. But well, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I don't usually sing with this, but so you have to bear with me. No, I have I have one, so that's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> साहिब सरकारों में चूड़े Thank you. 
दो जर में त्रे जर में हराम हलाल पछाता नहीं दो हादे नहीं भर में बुल्ला झुंड मुख पिया तो लाया शर्म न रही दरबारों में चूड़े टड़िया सच्ची साहिब सरकारों में चूड़े टड़िया Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Sarah. So yeah, I mean, there's not much I can say after Sarah singing that, but the idea um, behind including, uh, including, te uh, including this poetry is that again, shrines are sites of a performative tradition and are sites of performances where th these kinds. I mean, this 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 text, this textual recovery works alongside a lot of contemporary. Um, what's the name of that singer? Uh, Rani, um, the, think, the singer who sings the contemporary Dalit stuff in East Gini Punjab? Guinea Mai. Gini Mai. So, so Guinea Mai is a contemporary singer in East Punjab who's singing kind of a lot of assertive songs around uh, Dalit identity or Chamara identity. And it, it's it, part of, again, this is not seen, has not been considered part of the, or worthy of the kind of academic canon. I mean, especially in South Asia, I do remember giving a paper where I talked about music and performance, and it was just seen as not serious in relationship to, well, what are, you know, the kind of issues that are going on. So again, it's about the lens. And I mean, there are also epistemological and good uh, issue, epistemological issues in relationship to what kind of value we give to these kinds of textual sources. But you know, maybe that's something we would take up uh, in, um, in questions. Thanks. Uh, so like Virinder just said, it's really hard to go after Sarah. Nothing I say will be as profound, as beautiful as what she just sang, right? Uh, so when I asked Tej, how should I respond? How should I frame this response? One of the things that she said was, think about it this way. Talk to people who may not actually read the book. Talk to people who might read the book after this discussion. So that's how sort of I'm, I'm going to speak about uh, my reading of the book and what we can think about it and learn from it and, and sort of push on it. Uh, and I'm going to take us away from the field of Punjab and thinking about the ethnography in a different way. So I want to start with three sort of narratives. The last one, uh, the, the first one rather, is actually leading from what Virinder just talked about, the, the singer Ginni Mahi. So the, in the last paragraph of this wonderful book, uh, there is a lot about, we hear about a Punjabi woman, Dalit woman singer, Gurkhan Wal Bharti, popularly known as Ginni Mahi. Ginni Mahi sings what can be identified as devotional hymns or shabads, but in a way that's upbeat and popular. She's quite popular, she has a huge following, she has a YouTube channel and Instagram and Facebook where she keeps her followers updated. She's a follower of the Ravidasa Dharam, which could be described as a religious spiritual path that broke away from mainstream Sikhism and centers the teachings of Sant, Gu uh, Sant Ravidas. And she also focuses a lot of her songs on Ambedkar. She calls herself the daughter of Ambedkar or the daughter of Baba Sahib, who she says wrote our constitution and that she's proud to be his daughter. And she's continuously connecting the songs and teachings of Ravidas through her uh, religious beliefs and her following in the Ravidasya Dharam, along with the teachings of Ambedkar. She evokes the abolition of caste, Dalit consciousness, equality in almost all her songs, interspersed and working together, working alongside with religious registers. I spent some time listening to some of her songs after I finished the book recently and going through some of her social media pages quite obsessively actually and looking at her public interviews to try to think about what, what, how we can push this last paragraph of the book 
even further and start thinking of new things that we can discuss here. So her albums are named after very religious devotional sort of names like Gura Didivani, Gurpura Bhai Kanshi Wale Da. And all the songs, and especially her most popular songs, center on Bedkar. One of her songs is called Fan Baba Sahibdi, which means a fan of Ambedkar. And in an interview, she talks about how she combines the teachings of Ambedkar and Ravidas, and she says that so many years ago, Ravidas and then Ambedkar had said that I want the kind of rule, we want the kind of rule where people live with equality, humanity, and without caste division. So she also calls Ambedkar Kaum the Masiha, the community's Messiah. And some of her posts on social media also interestingly evoke Guru Nanak. Gindi Mahi also talks about how her official name, Gurkanwal Bharti, is interesting because her Dalit family chose to give all the children in that family the surname Bharti, all the children in, the genera in that generation. And she says, Pehle India hai, pehle desh hai, isliye Bharti ke naam ke pehchan diya ja raha hai. We are first Indians and that is the identity we want the children to have. And that is the identity that was needed. She says that she sings devotional songs because she wants to wants people to remember their gurus and she wants to find a niche where she can both be comfortable with her religious beliefs as well as with her Dalit woman identity as well as where she can be popular and loved and beloved by the audience. And so her, I looked at her Facebook, Instagram post to see what, what kind of messages are present not only in her songs but also in the way that she has crafted and created this persona around her. And a lot of her Facebook and Instagram posts are also using Ambedkar's quotes, interspersed with a little bit of uh, Ravi Dasa's teaching, interspersed with uh, images of Guru Nanak. Her social media posts are filled with also crafting a very particular Punjabi femininity that is youthful, popular, and appealing, but also does not transgress too many boundaries of gender. She, in another interview, said she dreams of doing a PhD in music and ultimately making a career in Bollywood where she wants to sing like Lata Mangeshkar, Shreha Goshal, and Suniti Chauhan. I'll come back to why this narrative spoke to me in just a bit. The second narrative I want to talk about is from my own field work and my own ethnography with Hindu nationalist women. So we've already talked a little bit about Hindutva, about the rise of religious nationalism in India. I want to sort of think about that and think of what this book offers us to rethink some of these debates and how it speaks to some of the debates happening on religious nationalism. So as you probably already know, if you're in this room or, or you've sort of, uh, you know, uh, thought about from Tej and Virinder's uh, uh, discussions. There is a large project of Brahmanical religious cultural nationalism currently also in parliamentary power in India, the Hindu nationalist movement. And my research particularly focuses on women in this movement. How are women important to this movement? The many ways in which they contribute to the movement, they run various aspects of the movement, they also sort of build and nurture intimate affective practices in the movement and at the same time they also participate in a lot of the physical violence of the movement. And for decades they have been kind of ignored in the academic literature, like Virinder spoke a lot about, you know, the sort of limitations of the ways in which we theorize and think, and a lot of the literature around thinking about uh, women in the movement thought of them particularly as a problem, but also at the same time as victims, as, you know, being sort of like, uh, you know, this idea of false consciousness that they're only there because they're being forced to. So in my research, I looked a lot at how are women participating and did a lot of ethnographic work with them. And one of the interesting things that I found, which also since, since 2014 has become really uh, well popularized, is the role of religious figures and scriptures. And I mean, not only sort of Savarna, upper caste, religious figures and goddesses that are continuously evoked in very mainstream discourse as well, but also the construction of different types of iconographies and symbolisms that sometimes move around between these boundaries. For example, uh, one of the women that I interviewed who was the head of uh, the Delhi chapter of an organization called Durga Vahini, the Army of Durga, uh, Ranjana, and she started talking about how not only did she follow symbols and, symbol and iconographies of sort of goddesses 
goddesses like Durga and Kali and goddesses that are quite popular in the movement. But she had spent a lot of time creating new goddess figures that she took to different neighborhoods, depending on the kinds of women that were there. So she said that we are consciously trying to appeal to Dalit women, and so we've come up with figures that will appeal to them, which have goddess imageries, but in different ways. One of them is holding a picture of Ambedkar in one of the hands. Another one is holding a broom to sort of signify the kind of working class Dalit women, uh, uh, signify symbols that working class Dalit women would be attracted to. Interestingly, she also continuously talked about how she has been praying at numerous Muslim shrines for a child that she was trying to have for many years. And she also spoke about all the, as she calls them, the good and well-meaning well -meaning Muslims in Pakistan that she has found online who are helping her pray at particular shrines across the border that she cannot cross for various reasons, including uh, the fact that she spends most of her time talking a lot of, uh, uh, talking about violence against Pakistan. So these could be dismissed as aberrations, right? And personal anecdotes, yeah, this is just one woman. She's longing for a child. Of course, she's going to do all it takes and pray at all the places. But as I found through the field work, these were not isolated stories. These sorts of borders of gender, caste, religion, nation were continuously moving, were continuously being contested, often in really contradictive ways that don't make sense, that, that want you to you know, stop doing that field work in some ways. And, try to make sense of, but this is what we are dealing with. So a lot of simplification that we see around Hindutva, this book offers us ways to rethink some of those implications, to, to rethink some of those contradictions. The last narrative I want to focus on is on is, is work that I've recently read by Khalid An Anis Ansari, who directs the Dr. Ambedkar Center for Exclusion Studies and Transformative Action uh, located in Saranpur, Uttar Pradesh. He talks about caste and Indian Muslims in particular. And he talks about how this, this idea of this growing religious nationalism, Hindutva, that is victimized Muslims is perpetuating caste inequality amongst Muslims in different ways. So he says something about how 85% of India's Muslim population falls under the Pasmanda Muslim category, which translates to those who have fallen behind, including what, what, what are referred to as backward classes, Adivasi, Dalit Muslims. He says, at the same time, Muslim politics in North India continues to be dominated by upper caste Muslims who are actually in the minority, referred to as Ashrafs. So he asks us to think about these differences when we talk about the violence of religious nationalism. He says, the victimization of Muslims must be complicated by class and caste and spatial distribution of vulnerability. Take the Muzaffarpur violence of 2013. There were riots in Muzaffarpur in 2013, and there's also a film about it called Muzaffarpur Baki Hai. When the rioting mobs attacked Muslim colonies and Muslim areas, they spared Muslim Jats and Muslim Gujars. When we talk about this kind of violence and think about the kinds of spaces that are being attacked, we have to think about what sorts of spaces they are. He says they're mostly subaltern spaces, not elite Muslim spaces. They're mostly slums where lower caste Muslims are residing. You have to look at the victims in terms of class and caste. The Muslims who are attacked are mostly from poorer uh, parts of India migrating from Bihar and Uttar Pradesh to Mumbai, to Bivandi, to Muzaffarpur, places that have witnessed horrific riots. And those who are attacked are mostly Pasmandas, whereas he also says that most Muslims who are benefiting from what he calls a narrative, a homogenizing narrative of Muslim victimhood are upper caste Muslims or the Ashrafs. So he asks us to rethink how we think about this idea, that this, um, this idea of the, the Muslim victim in current India, in contemporary India under Modi, needs to be complicated by constantly thinking about how caste and class figure in it, and not thinking about caste and class and how they shape this, uh, the, the practices, the experiences of Muslims in India only perpetuates caste inequality. So I, I, I sort of wanted to put these three narratives out there because they, they allow me to do a few things. One to push the sort of ending of the book. You, when you ended the book, you said it's not a conclusion, it's an epilogue, you know, further conversations to think about. So this is one thing that I, I felt that we could think about the book and take it further. Secondly, to contextualize and, and complicate some of the contemporary debates around religion, gender, and caste in South Asia, uh, in Punjab, of course, as the book wonderfully does, but also beyond Punjab. 
and to unpack a few ideas and few themes in the book. For example, the idea of borders and boundaries. The book makes a, a very concrete point over and over again that Hindu and Sikh, Sikh and Muslim were not as porous, uh, were, were porous and not as absolute identities. From Ginni Mahi's songs, we think about how these borders move, how these boundaries move for her being a Punjabi woman, a folk singer, a Dalit woman, a woman, being a follower of the Ravidasa Dharam, being a part of this sort of religious movement, being an aspiring Bollywood singer who also continues to sing in the register of devotion, being popular, being youthful, and at the same time coming from a lineage where there is a lot of uh, attachment to the nation and to the idea of India, given that her family family named all the children uh, with the surname Bharti and insisting that this was about love for country before love for religion and love for caste. So also the other thing that it makes us think about, which Tej already picked on, is, is the idea of religion and religion making. We can think about re uh, secular liberal ideas of how people interact with religion and the political through religious registers going beyond notions of false consciousness or notions of rescuing and vigilance narratives. This is something that comes up in my own work when, when a lot of the scholarship around Hindu nationalism and gender and women focuses on the idea that these women would never really want to be in this movement and the, the women are continuously read as an aberration. Or there is a reluctance to actually think about how we might want to rethink ideas on feminism, ideas on gender, through this participation, through this very active political participation in violence. And I think similarly through participation in any kind of religious forms, when, uh, when the whole, uh, you know, a few years ago with, Gur, what's his name, Gurpreet Ram Singh? Ram Rahim. Ram Rahim. Yeah, Gurmeet Ram Rahim's uh, court hearing came out. There was a lot of discussion, especially amongst what could be identified as secular liberals, that like, who are these people who are actually following this man who has, you know, clearly uh, engaged in sexual violence, who's clearly so... Uh, so weird even were, were, were some of the ideas because he had this popular video called Love Charger that he was singing, but he had a massive following of women, of Dalit women as well. And there was a lot of discussion on who are these ignorant people that are following him, who are these people that are involved in this movement, how can we sort of rescue them from this blind faith. So I think this book in particular helps us rethink those notions, helps us rethink ideas around resistance, agency, how all of these work and how all of these get complicated. And finally, the last couple of points I would make is that one of the things that I really appreciated about the book is that it doesn't, it doesn't just take categories of identity like gender and caste and apply intersectional analysis to it. Instead, it does something quite different. It thinks about how gender and caste are connect with religion, how they're inherently constituted, co-constituted through religion, and how religion is co-constituted through gender and caste. The last thing that I would say is that, you know, you've already mentioned the Kartarpur corridor and the opening and sort of border crossings in all sorts of ways. The book allows us to think of all of these digital tra and transnational border crossings from the ways in which religion was evoked in uh, when the Babri Mosque was demolished in 1992, where various uh, South Asians sitting in the diaspora here were contributing money and bricks even to, to go to the building of Ram Temple, to how we hear about it now, the recent news reports of uh, Hindutva groups uh, influencing the parliamentary elections here and urging British Hindus to vote against labor, to how we think of a figure like Gini Mahi, who is you know, appealing through, uh, to an audience through a lot of digital participation and is appealing to a transnational audience, actually, and through how we think about registers of global Islamophobia. So there's a lot to think here about the way in which the digital and the transnational figures with the border crossings. So I'll just stop with that. Okay, well now we have some time for questions. We have about half an hour. I'm trying to make these questions rather than comments, if you can. Um, but comments are welcome as long as they're short. Um, and so we'll take the first question, please. Wait a bit because it's still a bit garbled, but let's see if I can if I can manage something. So, um, and I think it picks up on some of the things that Akanksha was just talking about. But, um, I, yeah, I was wondering. Uh, well, there's actually a couple of things. One thing um, I think. 
that you mentioned something about how some of the Dalit practices, that some of the or women's practices, that they may not even ascribe resistance to what they're doing. Um, and I wondered about um, how, we, how we ascribe resistance if they themselves are not. Um, and at the same time, I was wondering in, in, through, and I asked this for instrumental reasons because I'm trying to do similar work and it, it would be helpful to know how you approach this. As someone who is a social scientist engaging with religious and spiritual sites, how to, how to read them as social sites without diminishing or, um, or not adequately taking into account the, the kind of spiritual dimension of those sites and the kind of logics, the spiritual logics that may be at play when we are primarily treating them as kind of sites of sociality. Question. Do you want to take three? Okay, any more? Take three questions at a go. Go ahead. Sorry, I've got to wait for the mic to get to you. Any other Hello. questions lined up in the meantime, just let me know. So. Uh, thank you. I have so many questions and I'm looking forward to reading this book. Uh, but I was quickly wondering about uh, the poem that's been uh, put up here. Uh, I mean, Bule Shah is from uh, Pakistani Punjab, uh, celebrated. Uh, and uh, the, the singer, this Jamar singer in, uh, in East Punjab, uh, I've always seen, I'm from West Punjab, and I've always felt uh, that, of course, with this uh, the Ambedkarite turn in uh, politics as it developed uh, uh, in India uh, has enabled uh, groups to uh, develop a politics uh, like this, which uh, uh, is very much absent in, uh, in West Punjab. Uh, and so it, for me, uh, I've always been, uh, Chuda is, uh, it's almost like saying a nigger uh, if, you, if you say Chuda. And so, uh, you, you know, it, it's a highly, uh, uh, offensive term. Uh, and so I was wondering in, in your interactions with uh, uh, with people in uh, Lahore or all these other areas, how did this <coughs> sort of pan out? And Because you've been using the term Dalit, and Dalit is not a term that is used in West Punjab at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is certainly a politics that, that, that is taking place. There is certainly uh, uh, a lot that's happening there. So I wanted to ask uh, what uh, that may be here. Especially around digital technologies, because over a 10, ten year period of field work, that would have been a huge yeah. transformation for people. Okay. Go ahead. If you want to ask a question, can you just raise your hand and I'll be identifying you for the, the roving mics? Is this? Yeah. 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 So the, yeah, the first one on resistance, actually the easiest way for me to answer that is sometimes just being is resistance in some of these spaces, right? Um, and sometimes, you know, resistance is a conscious act of rebellion uh, in the face of hegemony. But I think it's that space of being and recognizing, you know, the, the and I think that's why the, the, the broader context of the rise of the, you know, the forces, um, which is a very heightened, sharpened political context in contemporary India and Pakistan. I'm very conscious of the very Indocentric kind of leaning of some of the conversations. And I think Abraham's question kind of brings it back to thinking, in fact, what you're looking on one side of the border may not appear as resistance. And, one, and on the other hand, terminology will apply and be offensive. In other form, it may appear as resistance. So. I think it's a mixture of both. I think you have to be, and I think that was the challenge for us, not even using labels and terms to ascribe something as an act of resistance. Um, and that required following up through you know, a number of different methods. So I don't know if that answers your question. So it's a being and actively resisting. And then the other was the spiritual is kind of going into, in some ways it kind of relates to that second question in entering into a social world. And, you know, Andre Bethea very famously kind of argued that, you know, that social scientists actually can't study religion without being atheists. You know, he put it that far. And I thought we probably kind of cite him in that, but we 
also kind of say, you know, you can, what, what's the big deal about religion? I think that's what the joke that our friend that I you know, narrated was, you know, what is the big deal? Why is there such a resistance to even talk about religion? I think now in many ways, maybe the book will be important in, or maybe it'll be a drop in the ocean in the context of contemporary India and Pakistan, where religious forces are really driving politics and we're still afraid to talk about religion and, and, and despite that. So entering into the sociality of it, I think we are having to, and I think Akanksha pointed to that, there's so many registers that we've actually been missing as social scientists to actually think, do we enter it into the terms of the transnational, the digital, popular culture? Um, you know, some of it is commodified culture, but actually there, is res there are resistance themes within it. So a lot of the, the kind of domain of the social world, which we only kind of touched on, and largely it's a very shrines-based um, research that we have done so far, could be branched out and thinking of, of, you know, we need to now be thinking more creatively and also opening up the ways in which we, we think about, you know, the social in relation to resistance. So I'll stop there. The next question was, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, re I'm actually glad the questions come up because it, this is one thing that was, especially going back and forth across the border. Um, I mean, one, of course, is around terminologies. Um, one is Dalit is a sense of, you know, assertion. And on the other hand, you know, the, the term Jura Juri is, 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 a, is an offensive term of, you know, of insult. And you also have, and there's a, you know, there's a politics around Bulisha, not knowing what his caste, but also saying he's Sayyid, you know, he's using that terminology to locate himself as someone saying, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, write this and to occupy or, you know, be, be in the shoes of uh, a Dalit woman or, you know, a Judy, right? So, I mean, I think the use of the terminology in terms of the field work across both sides of the pool. Even the use of the word Dalit in shrine spaces is not there, right? In East Punjab In East well. Punjab, right? I mean, yeah. Gini yeah, Mai no. uses the word Jamaat. She doesn't use the word Dalit. I mean, she's changed. She's changed now. But her early stuff, she did. So it's not in East Punjab. The word Dalit is only used, we use it as really as an analytical category, because we don't have a word. We don't actually have the language to talk about cows. But the, the hearing the term in West Punjab, I think, was the biggest shock for me. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah, so yeah. in India, that's yeah. illegal. In a public, place, that's illegal, right? Yeah. So you go in West Punjab, where there's there's no caste. In the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, there is no caste. There's a denial of caste. It's something that's practiced over there in India. That's a Hindu practice. It could be talked about in lots of. We don't practice, and yet you would hear, you know. So that's the hegemonic discourse, and in closed doors, in private in those kind of power relations where you know, you'll, you'll have someone you know, of a dominant caste with a marginal caste, in those relations you would hear it being used very frequently, right? So in many ways, I think even having it up here, I think is also an assertion of some sorts, and let's recognize caste for what it is in Pakistan. Um, and you know, in, in India, because that terminology around Dalit has ended up becoming a category in itself, and I think that, that also ra raises lots of problems, especially when the state begins to kind of wither away some of the you know, um, constitutional measures that were in around you know, reservations. So even the, 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 the term Dalit at some point will have a changed meaning as well. But yeah, it's a, that's an ongoing conversation. I also think uh, in, in uh, the, the one thing that we do in the book is say that it's not so different in India and Pakistan on some levels, the gender caste matrix. So if you, if you think about caste assertion in Punjab, in East Punjab, it starts in the 70s, and the Mazdur Kisan party, and really the recovery of this text comes out of that tradition. And the, in the 70s, the Mazdur Kisan party in West Punjab and the Naxalites in East Punjab, they're the only people who are talking about caste on the left. Yeah, they, you know, Sarotra in West Punjab. So there is an actual moment which, and then of course the political trajectories go off because Bhutto, you know, and so caste just disappears in West Punjab. But actually, at the moment in which it happens, it happens in both sides at the same kind of time. It's just the political trajectories don't go. So in the 60s, before, around the time of the Green Revolution in East Punjab, people are using this language. You know, it's only becoming embedded as, you know, as there's changes going on in the, in the rural infrastructure. And so, and so I, I don't think it's such a big... I mean, and, and like I said, in my, in, now she uses the word Jamar. 
Uh, and there's been, and so I wanted to just say that it's actually a bit like the African American recovery of the N word. Yeah, it's it's like a Jamar has been totally recovered because it would be similarly seen as disparaging in the 70s, but now it's not. It's seen as a you know it's like a, 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 you know it's seen as this kind of assert, a, a total assertion. But every assertion is met with violence. I think this is really important. In, in terms of even just, you know that any assertion by where it becomes material is met with violence. Uh, so and, and in West Punjab we see this around you know Christians is actually read as Dalit, yeah, in West Punjab. And every time you see any kind of assertion, you see the you know you see violence. And and this is really one of the things you know it's hard to it's hard because it's so embedded in the book's narrative. But it is it's so important to get that you know there's always this simmering like undercurrent of violence in any threat, in, of violence. threat of violence in any kind of assertion here. As, I mean, as you well know, the context of West Punjab. But it's the same in East Punjab. There's always this, despite the laws and despite the so-called whatever different, it, it, there's a real, there's a simmering, there's that simmering violence. Sorry. Digital. So you, want to, you want to do it? Yeah. Do you want me to do it? Um, so digital, no, so 10 years, yes, it changes a, a huge amount. There's online puja, you can ring up and book. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, the, the, sh all, the big shrines are all online. You can get online uh, numbers behind your credit card bookings. <laughs> you know, the whole stuff is, it's, yeah, it's, it's, but it's equally, you know, these shrines, that, these little shrines on the roadside that we've been following, you, can't find, you don't find them on the internet, you know, they still, the ephemerality is really important. Uh, the, that, that's a really important part of this, that this is people, this is people literally making shrines, right? This is literally what we see, what you see, and this is a very big dif distinction from, it is literally what people will make, will make their, sh will make shrines. And we see, we, in the small time we were there, you, we saw, you know, we saw shrines, be, and this is across the border. You see shrines that come up, and they go, like they come and they go. It, 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 you know, there is a waxing and waning of these, and this is, this changes the way we think about, perhaps think about religion. Uh, and so the digital helps in that because you can do it a bit quicker. But actually, it's still a similar process. Uh, but I do think it's a whole different project. You could think about the. How socially different? I don't know. I think I'm, yeah, less. It's yeah. more difficult to connect to the material. Yeah. I think also. I think what's interesting, the, the the ephemeral nature of the shrines that start as a brick and then the chandra appears, and then you know, one we saw in Chandigarh where it, it it was there for a few months, and we saw it every day as we're going driving, you know, drop off children to school. And you see, the next thing it's gone, and actually was it's some place that the local construction workers had someone had been injured there, and the story was there, and then it was gone. The construction site was gone, and therefore the you know local devotees were gone. But that story, I'm not sure how that would relate to the digital, right? So the the, that, the, the yeah the the situated the kind of the idea that a shrine, you know, what it represents, is it performing something or is it actually addressing material? you know, social relations. I think the digital probably sits slightly aside from that. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. My question is about um, the relationship between texts and the cultivation of self. So as um, when um, Dej was speaking about sometimes being is an act of resistance, that, and I realised you then you're talking about particular forms of self and uh, Chani and that uh, other um, gentleman whose picture you showed, the way that um, we, we know that certain forms of social science knowledge or modernist social science knowledge production is actually a site where those selves experience epistemic death. And, and we also know that um, in some ways metropolitan uh, knowledge production about these people have historically played this very big role in that it's, it's, um, it's 
enacting that epistemic death onto the elites of uh, India and Pakistan who are coming to the metropole, going back, and it's the, you know, and then they're perpetuating this epistemic death in the institutions that they're setting up, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and from the performance, we got a sense of some of the texts, the songs and the poetry that actually are kind of like the river that continues flowing. The, they're the sites where these other forms of non-partitioned selves keep flourishing. So what I wanted to ask is, where, where does your text fit in with this project of the cultivation of new selves? Is it, you know, does it have a relationship to that song that was sung? Does it have a relationship to the texts that are being sung or performed or remembered at the shrines and uh, things? Do you see it doing a kind of work in the classroom that enlivens a certain type of self? That's a great, That's a great question. question. Do you want to do do that question yeah, let's just do, should we just yeah, talk to that and then we'll come to the do you want me to question so I think uh, <coughs> where's the book it just walked out that it's way. just walked out <laughs> so in the form of which it is right now the best one can hope for is that it evokes something in a classroom yeah and generates some kind of debate or as you know this wonderful response that Gunsha gave that kind of response would be great uh, but in the dodgy copy or the digital world or, you know, when it becomes something, a paperback, which would be like for 100, 200 rupees and or we go and give it out to our friends or the people we talk to, it might circulate a bit differently or when we translate it, it might circulate a bit differently. But in the four, So I don't think it's a, sing, a single answer to a really great question. I think you have to work quite hard to circulate these texts outside of academia, outside of the English-speaking academia, maybe outside of the form of the book, you know, the websites or speak it. Or, so I think it depends, really, like what one does with it. I don't think the knowledge is neutral of its casing. So that would be my response. Yeah, I mean, I think thinking, I find it difficult to think about the book in terms of the self as well. Um, I'm even trying to imagine, so I can, I see the text as something that has just has evolved through, and I was sort of saying, I'm trying to think how many decades, in fact. So some of the stories that emerged through the pages of the book, I mean, the one story, you know, is from my family's, it's not even ancestral, post-partition village. So um, where an elder who was actually the, the, the second wife of my great uncle, right, um, who found it, in, her duty was to let me know that, her, that our family, our family as, you know, the second wife of this great uncle who was the zamindar, who was, right, the proprietary, you know, landlord. And to say, we must look after this because this is the shrine of the Muslims who left before. And so those kinds of stories circulate, yet I never, I kind of, I take those stories and that kind of gets logged. But my politics is quite different in terms of thinking, care, being a caretaker of the shrine as a dominant caste, you're reproducing that. So for me to... Having, having written that, I have to apply the gender cast. And for me to take the text out, it's about word of mouth. And I think it's about political activism also. I don't think it can just remain in the classroom. I think it has to be um, an engagement with the social world you're also in. So whether it's that family also, <laughs> or it's about um, narrating that field. Um, even thinking about Punjab and thinking, gosh, we still keep on going to Hindutva, looking this side of the border. We actually need to be, and it's thinking about a politics which is actually thinking critically about borders in South Asia. And it's okay to do it in the classroom. I think that's one project, but I think there are bit really big projects right now that are around. And I think it, it's a drop in the ocean, the text, but I think if any of the ideas kind of circulate in ways that inspire others to do other acts or forms of resistance, I think for me that would be a huge achievement. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, like some of the questions that I heard, they were really nice and they were also in my mind, so they are quite a bit answered. Uh, while uh, Nautej was talking about, you know, uh, these uh, people just being what they are, and that's itself an act of resistance, your existence or your beingness itself makes a, a kind of statement 
that you resist certain power relations in the society, and especially when it comes to the gender and caste dynamics, and also a class where you actually see these people kind of you know, standing against the power relations. I mean, that's the thing that you know when uh, the lady, like you know, who is singing songs, uh, when she is bringing Ambedkar, it's a challenge to the established you know homogeneous homogeneous narratives. And that's what actually it, I think uh, makes uh, as an act of resistance rather than just being what they are. They, they are conscious of it. They are conscious of the power relations that exist. And if they kind of you know, go, they do it because, because they think that is something that they should be doing. But they also are aware of the kind of, you know, uh, like some kind of you know, violence like reactions coming from the uh, upper caste and upper class kind of you know, uh, groups. That's one thing that I was thinking. The other thing was more about uh, when you were talking about your 10 and 12 years of field work. So you all had this thing uh, when you were saying this, this, this upper caste respondents, somewhere responded that, you know, those people don't really kind of, you know, uh, follow the religion well. And that's why the conception of egalitarianism uh, in Sikhism is not followed well because those people don't really follow the religion as a, as a, as a kind of, you know, way of whatever, you know, their life. Where I was just wondering, when you interact with other groups, especially Dalit women and kind of, you know, lower class people, uh, in, in the, because caste and class dynamics is, I think, more of a combination. You can't really separate in Indian context. People have tried in the, in the last, like, 50 years, but now we are coming to this point that we know. Religion is there, everything is there, but it's not out of anything. I mean, when you talk about class, so go to the like uh, the social and economic survey in India. You have what 80% of the people Muslim, Dalit, and Adivas is being below poverty line. So when you are talking about the poverty, when you are talking about anything, we need to understand. Okay, these are the groups and the location, social locations that are suffering most, and that becomes the kind of you know group of oppressed oppressed people in India. So there I was thinking like when we really kind of you know see these people, how do they really respond to these like you know, homogeneous narratives in your field work of 10 years? How do they really see that? Oh, oh, because the person that here was asking about the churi, right? So it's, it's, it's a very offensive word. But what makes it offensive? The position that one come from. Let's say people from upper class and upper caste, you know, locations, when they call these people churi, they basically de uh, notify the, uh, like, you know, signify the status of your not being worthy of human being. And that's what really makes it offensive. And in the same way, in these locations and the kind of, you know, bastis that we go to, and in Maharashtrian context, this cultural politics that we talk about, it's very active and it's been there, I think, 60, 70 years. And it is being transformed into the northern part of India in the last 20, 25 years that I see. But it's been there that, you know, people have been singing songs, people have been kind of, you know, trying to go around villages and trying to, you know, educate these people. And it's been there from the left movement, from the, you know, anti-caste movement, all kind of people were, uh, you know, participating in all of it. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's all. It's more a kind of comment and question and confusion on in your, the mind. On your last point, though, yeah. 60, 70 years, is, the, is, is your, you're going back to 1947. So that's, a, again, taking the nation state, Indian no, nationalism. No, not, not really. So, no. yeah, so I mean, like 60, 70 years, okay, I mean. So, so my, my response, though, is to say, let's go back. Well, there's text. Let's go back centuries. Mm. There are histories and texts which allow us to actually look beyond. And that's actually the kind of methodological okay. nationalism point we were making. Um, is actually looking at resistance to colonialism, resistance to patriarchy. Um, you know, Sufi texts such as the Bulay Shah one is another one. So those traditions are quite live, not just in Punjab, other parts. Maharashtra, of course, is very significant in terms of contemporary and historical mobilizations too. But the kind of cultural sphere is a really important one. I'm just conscious of the time frame in, in, and not falling back into thinking about how any kind of resistance is just looking back at Indian um, nationalism. It's also kind of imagining alternative ways of, of being, but also of resisting and can thinking about those borders that are oftentimes and generally imposed, whether it be the categories, even understanding um, poverty, you know, which groups, how, they're, how the pie is you know, sliced, tells us actually this isn't a religious problem, or it's a matter of caste, or it's a matter of region. So even that is a bordering practice in her, terms of how what the nation state kind of does. Yeah. Okay. I think we should okay. Stop soon. Um, okay. I think we're nearly out of time. Unless there's a really pressing question, you have the opportunity to ask questions uh, to both the authors at the drinks reception in the SCR, to which you're all welcome to. 
One thing I just want to say before we close, um, well, I want to say two things. One is an absolute huge thank you to Tej Verinder, Akanksha, and Sara for making this a really memorable and fantastic launch for both the book and the series. But also to remind you that next week's seminar in this place at the same time is going to be titled Marginal Development, States, Markets and Violence in Drug-Affected Borderlands, which I think will actually Turn connect in many, well, but also connect in many ways. And hopefully this evening's seminar has given you some food for thought that you'll be able to bring to the next seminar uh, to really think through the potential for um, thought that crosses all of the boundaries not always at all at once, but <laughs> that's something to aim for. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. Thank, thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.